Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NASC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. On behalf of our literary committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's very special event featuring Jean Hanf Korlitz, author of The Undoing, who will talk shop with fellow thriller writer Scott Turow, author of Presumed Innocent and The Last Trial. They will discuss thriller plots, screen adaption, Jean's original novel, and her newest cliffhanger, The Plot, which was published a few weeks ago, and it was announced today, actually uh, about two minutes ago, that it is on the New York Times bestseller list. The Undoing and the Plot can be purchased from our independent bookseller, Books on Call, at a discount, and we'll be sharing the link in the chat during the conversation. Following the discussion and conversation will be brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Scott and Jean. Please enjoy the conversation. Well, let me just start out by saying how much I love this book. Uh, and uh, I gobbled it up. It was, uh, and it's, you know, and it's a, it's a joy at many levels. Um, first, you know, it, it is one of those books that presses you back into your seat uh, and makes you stay there uh, for a long period of time. And that's wonderful. You just want to turn the pages. Um, but the writing is, as usual, with, uh, with my friend Jane, um, is terrific. It's first rate. It's beautifully done. Uh, you crawl inside of uh, the skin of, uh, of, of a, a writer, Jacob Finch Bonner. And, uh, you know, he, he becomes in himself a very, I think, compelling guy. So, uh, not always you know, a likable guy, but a compelling no, guy. No, but, but that, that's, and anyway, we, we can get into that, but, uh, yeah, I, I, just, thought were, I thought you were going to say it sends you back to uh, what it was like to to think of yourself as a failed writer. And then I thought, well, gee, when did when did Scott Turow ever think of himself as a well, you see, that, that's the mythology about about me. But, um, you know, for years, I couldn't get anything published. So not true. Uh, I know yeah. That. I mean, during my I was a writing fellow out at Stanford and, um, you know, I literally couldn't get anything published. So, uh, and ended up with a contract to write 1L, which is a nonfiction book by accident. And then, you know, years later ended up in, in Jean's clutches when she was working, <laughs> when she was working at Ferris Strauss and Giroux. We have, uh, not to tip our hand too much, but we've been friends for 35 years, so. Right, so I think this is interesting because when we first met, it was at the moment of your, your, your first great uh, success with Presumed Innocent, and I was, extremely important because I was the editorial assistant to your editor, Jonathan Glossy, which, which means that I was the person who, you know, copied things for you, <laughs> brought you, I don't know, did I ever bring you coffee? I would have brought you coffee. In fact, I'll bring you coffee right now if you want. <laughs> but, um, you know, to watch that book explode. And, and that was an extraordinary summer uh, for for our Strauss because it was you know it was the year of presumed innocent and also a bonfire of the vanities so everybody in the world if they weren't reading presumed innocent they were reading bonfire of the vanities and vice versa and you know I would get on the subway to go to work and the, the subway car would be filled with these two novels it must have been an incredible time for you yeah it was like being uh, as I tell um, as I tell writers who occasionally find themselves in the same position. It's just like taking a ride on a, you know, on a, on a SpaceX rocket. It's uh, you're on the way, but let's, let us talk about the plot. Okay. Um, and I think first I've heard you tell the story of how this book happened. Yeah. And I would, 
I would like you to do that first, if that's okay with you. Sure, sure. It certainly never gets old to me. I mean, I still can't believe it happened, really. Um, I, I should preface this by saying that I, uh, of my seven novels, most of them were ideas that I thought about for literally decades. Um, you know, I, I, I would have an idea, I would think about it for a couple of decades, and then I would write <sighs> chapter one. Um, twice in my life it was the opposite of that i got um i got just sorry, these are my daughter's dogs who were going crazy in the background um it was just boom out of nowhere uh the first time was with you should have known which became the undoing and the second took place in my editor's office in january of 2020 which was a super fun time as we all remember especially those of us who were getting uh very worried about something that was happening in China because we've read way too many books about um, pandemics. Um, but also it was an unhappy time because uh, I was working on a novel that, that wasn't coming together. And I was having this meeting with my uh, my editor. Uh, now your editor, we should stop. Your, your Deb editor is Deb Futter, who's who been my editor too. Ready. Right, so um, I, I adore her as I know you do. And she said, you know, I, she was telling, she's in the middle of telling me why it wasn't working. And I never for a minute thought that she wasn't right. I mean, I knew even uh, in that meeting that she wanted the book to be as good as it could. So it wasn't, she wasn't telling me anything that, you know, was for any reason other than that I needed to make the book better, which was what we both wanted. But it was very hard to hear because I had been working on this book for a couple of years. And I had already had this meeting with her six months before. And I had spent the intervening months revising and it still wasn't working. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so upset about this meeting that I actually made my husband come with me. Um, oh. I, I was just grown up enough to leave him downstairs in the Starbucks across the street. <laughs> <laughs> and and actually, that was not entirely my choice. I would have dragged him into the office with me if I could have, but it's a good thing that I didn't. So in the middle of this meeting, um, I I said to her, I, you know, one of the reasons I'm so uh, unhappy that we're still not done with this book and that I have to go back and revise it again is that I, I have this other idea. And uh, then I said, well, don't you want to hear what it is? And she was being polite as, you know, editors are usually and she said yes and so I started to tell her this story and I was telling the story for the first time I mean I was thinking it through as I was uh, telling it I knew most of it I didn't know all of it because I think it's fatal to know everything before you start writing um, and I could see her get more and more excited which was really gratifying and and uh, I felt better you know I left the meeting I thought okay well you know we still have a future together we're going to work on other books and uh and then the next day you know my agent called me and just said what you know what just happened and you walked into this meeting because you couldn't sell a book and you're 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 selling two books and and i i had never had that security of a, a two book contract that made me feel fantastic and what we decided was you know the obvious thing which was that i was going to put aside the book that i had been laboring over for a couple of years and i was going to write this thing called the plot um and then you know i would come back to the other novel afterwards and then everything shut down so um i was i was in a, a place we own in upstate new york it's just me and my husband we're both writers and uh, i had a very uh, good uh, motive to not be that connected to what was going on in the world because i was scared out of my mind and, you know, for three or four months, all I did was write this novel. And, and you know, so when I say, oh, I wrote it in four months, that that's not quite accurate. You know, I wrote it in four months plus the 35 years of writing novels that allowed me to write this novel in four months. Also, I didn't do anything else. So you, you've, you sort of have, well, well, let's let the people listening in on uh, as much of the cat as you want to let out of the bag. Right. Um, so t tell us the plot of the plot. The plot of the plot. So meta. What a meta novel. Um, all right. So this is a story about a failed writer. And, you know, uh, we all carry our failed writer very close to the chest. Um, even those, you know, as I just heard, who uh, 
you know, have been best-selling authors for many, many years. Um, this is about a failed writer who is teaching in a sort of bargain basement MFA program. And into his class walks that student, that horrible student that apparently is in every single MFA class. He's the guy who kind of sits like this and goes like, who the hell do you think you are? And he's just obnoxious and horrible. And he's a braggart. He, he says, I don't need to be here. You can't teach me anything. I am writing a novel that's going to be massively successful because it has a plot that is foolproof. And our protagonist, the failed writer, his name is Jake, um, you know, thinks he's a jerk. And an amateur but then in a private session he hears the plot and he knows that this awful awful amateur writer is absolutely right he's going to write this novel it's going to be massive and there's nothing he can do about it nor should there be anything he can do about it it's not his novel then um, a couple of years later he discovers that this writer this student has died and he's died shortly after their encounter not nearly with enough time to have even you know if he had worked hard to have completed this book and therefore there is no book and now there is this story there is this kind of bright shining thing that is is calling out to him because he is a writer and he takes this story and he writes a novel and the novel, of course, becomes massively successful. But he can't really enjoy his success because he's too terrified that somebody will come along and accuse him of stealing something, you know, that was not his. So, so that's where we are. Sorry. So I, I have to be what I am, which is a lawyer. Uh, and I... I, I Certainly, do you think what Jacob Finch Bonner does is wrong? Yeah, is I love wrong? this question because I realized um, a few months ago I did two different interviews about this and I answered this question two different ways. <laughs> I, clearly, I am clearly undecided. Um, I don't. I don't really think what he did was wrong. He doesn't copy a single word. He, he only sees a couple of pages of this thing. And what he saw, he goes out of his way not to replicate. He has only taken this story and he has made from the story a completely different uh, novel with different characters. And um, I do not think what he did was wrong. Um, but I think like Jacob himself, that the world is populated by people who will think what he did was wrong. And I'm enough like Jacob that I, I am horrified by the notion that anybody would accuse me of stealing anything, which by the way, they are doing, which is kind of meta and weird, but also very funny. Um, so I, 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 I think he thinks that he will be blamed and that it won't matter that what he did was not wrong. You, and did you do? Did you get an IP cons, consult on this? Did you talk to an IP lawyer? I mean, um, um, I know I googled. I'm afraid. <laughs> no. no, but I, I, I'm not, I'm unsettled about whether um, stealing somebody's plot is actually some kind of copyright violation. Because what you're talking about, of course, is that you know copyright normally protects the fixed expression on the page. Um, but some, something tells me that uh, somebody could cobble together a pretty good lawsuit um, if, if, you, if, if they could successfully maintain that you, quote unquote, stole their idea. Yeah. So. Uh, well, I guess it's something, I'll add, just add it to my list of things to worry about now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I wasn't worried about that, okay, but... Uh, you know, so you wrote you, one, one of the things that I love to think about is all of the novel, all of the stories that our stories stand on the shoulders of. So, like, we write a novel. It is the product of our imagination, but our imagination is crammed full of the stories we've heard, the novels we've read, the movies we've seen, the episodes of Law & Order, we saw, I mean, it's all in there. And when it comes out in this new configuration, it is scary, but also counterproductive to try to pick apart what came from where. Right, I, I mean, 
it, the question is really not so much about breaking the law as, as not acknowledging the sources. Right. Um, right. So, I mean, Jane Smiley won a Pulitzer Prize with, with Shakespeare's plot of King Lear. Right. Uh, and there, there are countless examples of so the same many. thing. So many, so many. So, but, um, you know, he, he, he never answers the question, of course. Um, the, all writers are asked, you know, where do you get your ideas? It is our uh, number one most loathed question. Right, right, right. And, uh, and, and the plot, because it's so much about writers, repeats uh, a story that, you know, Stephen King is said to, I, I've watched him do this, you know, surrounded by reporters and where do you get your ideas and strokes his chin and, uh, and says, you know, Schenectady yeah, or, and, or, or Utica as, well, it, yeah. as it's put, as it's put in the plot. And but, that is um, kind of interesting because, you know, they're both, they both seem like great answers. Right, but um, um, a couple of questions about the writing of the book. Um, how much was baked before you got to Deb's office? How much of the, I mean, did we go beyond the, the part that you've already related? And I saw something come by in the, uh, in the chat where somebody was asking, well, isn't this too many spoilers of, uh, about the plot of the no, plot? This is like 25 pages into the book. Yeah, this is, this is. Ago, don't worry. Uh, uh, you know, how much was baked in? I knew what the plot was. I knew what this thing was that was so radioactive that, um, you could write it, I could write it, you know, Joe Smith could write it, and probably it would do pretty well. Um, I, you know, I've, according to Goodreads, which is, may or may not be accurate, I've read about 3,000 novels in my life, and I hmm. have never come across this plot. Um, that doesn't mean no, somebody didn't write it and I didn't see it. it it's entirely possible. 3,000 is a lot, but it's not every novel ever written. Um, but it's pretty darn rare, I think. So I had that, and then I had the theft, um, Jake's theft or non-theft, depending on how you look at it. And the rest kind of unspooled as I told the story out loud. But as I said before, you don't want to know everything when you start. You want to have this, you know, this dark space to go into and illuminate bit by bit, because that's where the excitement is for the writer. If we have nothing to learn as we're setting out to write the book, um, it's going to be pretty dry and uninteresting to the reader as well. I mean, if it feels like, well, I've got my index cards on the wall and I'm just going to connect this one to this one to this one to this one, you know, I, I feel like that translates to the reading experience. So you, you said you wrote this in four months. Was it a joy to write this book? Well, uh, it certainly was the most intense writing experience of my life. But given everything that had to happen for this book to be written, and I'm talking about, you know, in terms of what happened to our planet uh, over those months and what was happening in terms of uh, uh, the failures of our government. I mean, I was so miserable in the real world that mm. um, it, it was not a joyful time but it certainly came racing out of me in a way that I don't think any novel ever has before. I'm not sure I would ever want to have this experience again. It really was so awful, but I, it, was, it was also, I was so grateful that I had this book to write. I was grateful I had work. I was grateful I could do it in my house and not see anybody. Um, and I was grateful to be distracted from what was yeah. going on. Yeah, I found that period, um, I found it almost impossible to write at the beginning of yeah. the pandemic because it was like, uh, as I, it was like somebody was playing a scratchy record in the room next door. And it, it kept, it kept repeating. So I'm, I'm impressed, but not surprised having read the book that uh, it took hold of you the way it did. Um, I just wondered if it was as joyous to you at this stage in your career 
Um, oh, that absolutely. I mean, this has been all delight and and pleasure, and I, I'm having, may I say, the publishing experience of my life with this with this book and with the people who have, you know, worked so hard to to support this book. I mean, yeah. I, I've been telling people this is the Rolls Royce of publishing experiences that I'm having, and you know, there there may at this point be a better more you know, luxurious car than a Rolls Royce, but I don't know anything about cars. So it is the Rolls Royce of publishing experiences. You know, in this, when this discussion, it, as you started speaking, I suddenly was drawn back um, to my days. Of, after college, I went out to Stanford as a writing fellow. And, you know, a lot of interesting people around the Creative Writing Center at Stanford. And I remember... I, I wish I could remember this man's name, but I can't. But he told me that, and, and I think he was doing a doctorate and the thesis of the doctorate was that when writers start writing about writers, it's a sign that they are in trouble. There you and, go. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, and I wish I could, as again, as I said, I wish I could remember this guy's name because I'd send him this book and say, you know, sorry, Sorry, I'm sure you got your PhD anyway, but yes. uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that that's not that's what it means. Yeah. But this um, this book is certainly at its core about writers and the writing life. Yeah, and and that, not to give anything away, has been your life. That's true. So, I mean, right. my last proper job was, uh, you know, photocopying your your pages back at Ferrar Strews, Ferrar Strauss and Giroux. But so, you and your husband lived around the creative writing community at Princeton for many, many years. Yeah. Um, you know, there were writers in and out of your house. Um, yeah. And I was interested in your reference to, to Jacob Finch Bonner as a failed writer. Yeah. I wanted I wanted you to expand on that because I wouldn't that's not how I would have described it oh really well that's interesting um he's a writer who has uh his first novel is the hilariously named uh the invention of wonder which is an, a title that means absolutely nothing and yet seems like completely a, a title you would see on any li uh, literary novel. The Invention of Wonder. What does that even mean? Nothing. Um, he writes uh, a first novel. It is published by a good publisher. It sells not very many copies. He And, the, and that's sort of the end of his ideas. After that, he, he doesn't really have anything, but he chokes out another novel. And, you know, nobody will publish it. He finally ends up, I think, at a university press. Um, and that's it. That is the end of his, he's got nothing after that. Um, so he certainly feels like a failure. But one of the things I actually do like about Jacob, and there are, there are many things I don't like about him, he never blames anyone but himself. He never says they were out to get me or I'm a white male or, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't complain about publishing. He does not feel victimized by anyone. Um, he feels that he has failed, that his, uh, all of his effort um, and, and, and goodwill and, and humility and all of the things he trained himself to possess as a writer, all of these things have failed. I mean, have failed him. He has failed himself. And, you know, that's, that's where he is in his um, mid thirties teaching at this dumpy, horrible MFA program where he has to basically pretend <laughs> to care about these students and pretend that he can teach them because deep down he doesn't even think you can be taught to be a writer. I, I just, my own take on him was slightly different in the sense that um, it is very hard to have any kind of literary success yeah. in this country, right? There's, uh, I mean, there's, millions of devoted readers, but it's become more and more winner take all economy and publishing. Uh, and the books that do really well attract huge attention. Uh, and there are, you know, hundreds of wonderful writers yeah. who never get any recognition. 
Yeah. Not with, and I always go back to my own experiences at Stanford. Um, and there were terrific writers around me, some of whom, you know, Alice Hoffman, for example, or Richard Price, who, or, or Raymond Carver, who've had great recognition. But I always think about the people who were also equally talented, whose names um, nobody knows. And I, so I, I saw Jacob Finch Bonner in, in my heart. I assumed that the invention of wonder was, was actually a pretty good book. And that, you know, it was a, it was a notable book to the New York Times. So they must have, there, there must have been some merit to it. Right. Uh, and that, you know, he just hasn't gotten close to the brass ring again. Right. And it, it's, um, it's as much to me about um, the, you know, the difficulty of making a life in the, the difficulty of making a life in the arts. Yeah. And, um, but he's still doing it. Yeah. Well, maybe you're just a better person than I am. <laughs> I'm a lot more critical of him than you are. Um, you know, the, the real heroes are the ones who keep working, who keep doing it. And, um, you know, that, that was me kind of until, until this book. I mean, I, I just, I was always lucky that I had somebody who believed in me enough to take the next book and the next book and the next book, even though there was not much in my sales history, which as you know, is, is, is our, you know, Marley's chain that we drag around with us all the time yeah. um, to, to give them confidence that a, a next book would do any better than the last book. So I was very fortunate, but I'm also proud of myself that I kept going. And, um, right. and that, and that, it seems to me is what, is really at the core. So you have a guy who's confronted with um, the fact that his career, like many people's careers in the arts, uh, that, that he's not going to catch fire. Right. Uh, and it, it, it brings the question to mind, first of all, why are we doing this? And so I would say that, I would say that first of all to you, why are you doing you know? it? Do I, do why? I need to tell you why we're still doing this? Well, why, why do you do it? That's what no, I want to ask. Addicted. And what, and what do you think the, the many writers that you've been around, including the one that you married and live with, yeah. what, why yeah. do we do it? Uh, we do it because we're addicted to language. We cannot, we cannot quit language. Language is our drug. And, um, we get joy from it. And for us fiction writers, I think we also, um, I mean, aren't you excited every time you open a book? I mean, is, is this, am I gonna go somewhere? Am I gonna learn something? Am I gonna be wowed by the language? You know, most of the time the answer is no, but we, you know, we, we push farther, we beat, well, I'm not gonna misquote um, Fitzgerald here, but we keep going <laughs> because, the next one, I mean, this is why I use the word addiction. Addiction isn't a word you want to throw around casually. It is, I am excited every time I open somebody else's novel. But, um, though I have been disappointed many times. So, um, but, so here you are tonight, um, the, with, with the appellation that will never leave you again. <laughs> I never New, wanted to. <laughs> New York Times bestselling novelist. Yeah. And what does that mean to you? Everything. It means everything to me. I mean, I, I never allowed myself to really fix this star in my sights because I really never thought it would ever happen. Because, I, I mean, in spite of what happened with The Undoing and, and those who read the book and saw the TV show know that the, the two things were very, very different. Um, I mean, I, I think of myself as a literary writer. Um, I love plot, obviously. I'm obsessed with plot. I named my book The Plot. Um, but I didn't really think that writers like me would end up on, on the bestseller list. And that really means that readers uh, were willing to slow down a little bit, to delay gratification. Believe me, I've, I've now become very acquainted with the term slow burn a term I had never heard before a few months ago. It turns up in like every review on Goodreads. Um, it, 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 
it, it really makes me so happy that there are readers who are, 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 are willing to come along on this ride and not get the gratification. You know, there's no body on page one. There's no detective. There's, there's just a failed writer who's just screwing up. Yeah. Well, and I, and I also think you undersell your own career um, in, in the comments that, that you made about it. Um, the, uh, I mean, for one thing, uh, you've had two books adapted for, for, for film projects. That's right. That's true. right. And, um, and I, I mentioned that not frankly, because I think it's the, uh, the insignia of quality, um, but because it's, it, it has promoted your work to some extent, um, and because it's fun yeah. when it happens. It is uh, fun, it is fun. So, um, Did you find it fun? What, I'm sorry? Did you yeah, find I've it enjoyed. I've enjoyed it every time. The part that's not so enjoyable, of course, is when you go through the whole development project and uh, the, the, the whole development process, and then it, and then it gets killed, um, <laughs> which, of course, I've, I've seen several times before. Uh, and I, I have one book that was, a, they literally opened a production office in Chicago and the studio and the director got into fisticuffs and, and it stopped. So, uh, but every time it's happened, I've, I've, I have found it, um, I, I've just found it a great ride. Um, and yeah, they change it, but the books, they're not gonna change a word of That's what's right. been written. Right. So what has the process been like for you? Well, um, admission was a fantastic experience. Uh, my agent in Los Angeles just sent the book to the exact right person. And she had been looking for a project with a, a writer. And one of them had just gone through uh, trying to get her kid into private school. And they were full of righteous indignation about that whole experience. And uh, they just they really loved um, admission. And when Tina Fey became involved, it did change the tone of the project significantly. It, you know, the book is not a comedy, not at all, um, but it was tweaked in that direction after Tina Fey became, uh, you know, the, the star. Um, but it was a very writer friendly set because some of the actors were themselves writers. You know, Tina Fey is a writer, Wallace Shawn is a writer, even Paul White's the director is a playwright. So um, they were they were so generous to me and, and I became friends with the screenwriter. We're still friends and that was really nice. Um, with uh, the plot, I'm sorry, with um, You Should Have Known, which became The Undoing, I was completely uninvolved. I mean, David E. Kelly, is Picasso. I'm hardly going to say, I have a few suggestions for you. Uh, no, I mean, and, and he told me from the, from the outset that um, he was going to be interested in Jonathan in, in the husband's character in a way that the book really isn't. I mean, it, Jonathan's character in the book, he's the catalyst for everything that happens, but my focus uh, in the novel is on Grace, who became the Nicole Kidman character. So he said, you know, we've hired, uh, you know, uh, Hugh, uh, Hugh Grant. And you don't hire Hugh Grant for a character who isn't there. Um, I knew it was going to be different, and it was very, very different. I didn't even know who did it in, in, in the TV show until the last episode. I'm watching it with everybody else. I thought it was somebody else. <laughs> But that experience cannot have hurt the plot because The Undoing, I think, was a pretty successful show by HBO standards. It was. Um, and that, that was good for Jean. So well, it was fascinating, you know, and that I, I started to get a lot of questions like, well, uh, that was amazing what you did in the courtroom scenes. Like, no courtroom scenes in my book. You know, that none of that happened in my book. You you want this guy, David E. Kelly, who lives in California, go ask him. So I felt almost like I was some kind of a fraud, you know, taking credit for or being congratulated for all of these uh, things that had captivated so many people. But, you know, this is adaptation. You've got to go with the flow. You've got to just pass along the praise to the people who are, <laughs> who are responsible for it. 
but yeah, I mean, I, I haven't even reread You Should Have Known since 2014. So, yeah, I mean, do you have this experience when you finish with a book and you just move on? Yeah. But you're, you go back to the same characters a lot, so. I do, so I have to reread if, if uh, because the characters are going to, if they're going to reappear, I have to at least remember um, how old they are right. and, you know, what, what their allergies were, if that's what, uh, if that's going to be relevant. But uh, I don't reread my own books um, for, for just, you know, the, the saying that every writer, you ask every writer, any writer, what's the best book that you've written? The answer is always the one I'm working on now. Uh, and that is because you are in the phase where you can lie to yourself. Uh, and, and all, all of the problems that you are going to have faced by the time that book is finished, um, you... Uh, you can put that they're over the horizon. They're, you know, they're going to solve themselves magically. Uh, and so you're, you're full of hope. Um, and, but one of the things that, that, that this novel explores, and I think in a really um, effective way is exactly what is it that, that a writer is hoping for? Mm. Um, you know, is it, you know, is it the, is it true that if the tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it? Oh, that that's it's... not my pay grade, Scott. I cannot answer that question. <laughs> Since that's like beyond my bandwidth. I don't know what, I mean, we are, I mean, I think we all understand that there are no, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, yes, maybe this plot in the plot is something I haven't come across before, but in terms of the stories, the stories we know we know what they are i mean if you set off to uh solve a mystery or you throw a ring into the red eye of sauron we know you're going to have adversity along the way and we know you're going to battle your way back it's called a uh, 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 journey voyage and return i mean that's one of the great storylines these are kind of hardwired into us at this point and if you if we send our hobbits off to throw the ring in the fire and they then they all die the next day, we know something's wrong with that. We, we don't even accept that. So t to to just move the pieces around in some way that is feels inevitable and satisfying, but is also surprising. That's like the that's the golden ticket. I mean, uh, that's what we're trying to do. I don't I mean, you were not the first person to come up with the idea of a man being wrongly accused of a crime. <laughs> it's what you did with that that made it presumed innocent. And, you know, I've said this to you before. This is the only book that has ever made me, like, emit a sound in public because I was reading that chapter of Presumed Innocent. I was so shocked by... Um, a revelation, there's so many revelations in the book, but I probably know the one I mean, um, that I, you know, I embarrassed myself on the subway in New York City. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Uh, From what I understand, strange things happen on the subways in New York every day. They, yeah, even stranger than that, but they hadn't, I hadn't caused any of them until. <laughs> so, I mean, we have the pieces. We have the archetypes. We have the rules. We have you know, in some cases, the, the characters, the naive young man, the, you know, the wise older woman, whatever, but it's what we do with them to make these mosaics that are new. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. So do you, do you think, do you think Jacob is much changed by his success? Jacob can never get out of his own head long enough to enjoy his success. And it's, it's interesting how quickly it all sours for him. I mean, I put him in positions where I, I'm, get, I'm handing him his fantasies, like one by one. There's, at, at one point, he you know, fantasizes about what he, what he will say to people on the autographing line. And then I, I actually put him in that situation. And he's so you know, demoralized and incapacitated with fear and anxiety that, he, you know, at least enjoy it, you know, on behalf of all of us. You get this wonderful thing you've been working for for so long. At least 
have some fun with it. But no, he can't do it. And he's right to be worried because, you know, sometimes when you're paranoid, they are after you. Yeah, <laughs> you do have enemies. But yeah. um, and of course, it, it's because of that that my question is not completely a fair one. Um, but I, I found it very appealing that this man at core for all of his many foibles, um, he is not really carried away with himself. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, you know, he doesn't think the air he's breathing is any thinner or any uh, more refined than anybody else's. Uh, now, admittedly, he's, he's worried about getting discovered. But I think he wears his success um, very nicely. Um, you know, there's, uh, there are all kinds of funny little scenes where people um, recognize him or his book or, uh, you know, they're sort of like, are you the guy who wrote that book? And he's, you know, he says, yes. People are not transformed to be in his presence. Uh -huh. And that's, <clears throat> and that's okay with him. So, and I, and I do think um, the fact that he is in, at the end of the day, uh, a character that we can empathize with. <laughs> is part of what carries this book along. I, I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that. I mean, I, I once said to your, your former editor and my former editor and my former boss, Jonathan Galassi, that I had never written a, uh, a, a character I didn't want to smack. And that, you know, that was back in novel number two. And this is novel, novel number seven for me, and it's still true. I have never written a character that I haven't wanted to smack at some point. Um, but that's... I guess I'm not interested in super nice, easygoing people. So I, I saw the question come by um, and people want to know, are you, are you going to finish the book that you were stalled on in, yeah. in Deb's office? Yeah, I'm working on it now. I have to turn it in in about a month and a half. And, uh, you know, it's a very different book. I mean, I, I really love this book. Um, it, it's not, doesn't have maybe the kind of thriller thrust of the plot, but it's, uh, you know, I, 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 sometimes I think of it as my John Irving novel. Sometimes I think of it as my Meg Wallitzer novel. Um, it's got a very fun plot and it's very satisfying the way all the pieces come together at the end, but it does, I'm working on it, yes. The answer is yes. And I believe it's going to be published next spring. Cool. Yeah. So uh, you want anything you want to tell us about it? It's about a, a very tortured New York family um, in which the parents have had triplets. And when the triplets are almost out of the house, they defrost a leftover embryo and have another child. And it just, and this is a, yeah, I know. And this is a, a, a family in which uh, the, the, the three triplets are ab absolutely despised one another and they all set off in different directions. And it, it is really up to um, this late child to bring them back to one another. But they, you know, like that quote in Brides Had Revisited, they wander to the ends of the earth before they come back with a twitch upon the thread. So uh, it's, it's a, you know, it is not, it's a character driven book. It's got a lot of different stories in it, a lot of different protagonists. And it's a lot of, it will be a lot of fun when I'm done with it. So, oh, by the way, I should have asked, is there, is there film interest in the plot? There is, there's, uh, there's television interest and, uh, I can't say anything about it, but I'm very excited and it's, it's going to be a really interesting project. Yeah. Cool. And have you done any screenwriting yourself? No, but this time I'm going to get to, which is super exciting and terrifying. Yeah. So it's, it's a different form. I plan well, to buy a, one of those screenwriting for dummies books and uh, reread William Goldman's book about writing for screen and then I'll be super ready. Yeah, well, it's, you know, in my late age, I started doing a little of it, and it's very different. There's, there's nothing else to say about it. It's, um, 
it's a very epigrammatic form of writing. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the one, the one great line um, can, can, you know, can carry a scene. So, but I do think there've been a lot of questions that have been asked in the chat and we probably ought to okay. take them up. So Nadine, and if there you're- won't be, There won't be, they won't be on the level of if the tree falls in the forest, do I hear it, okay? Yeah, well, I still wanted to come back to that, but I'll test to you about it that next time we're having a drink. So, um, yeah, thank you both. There are quite a few questions indeed. Unfortunately, we won't have time to get to all of them, but we'll try to get to a few. Um, a question from John. Uh, when you write a thriller, do you have your surprise twists all worked out before you write, or do they come to you during the process of writing? Do you want to take that one, Scott, or should I? Well, I, there, there are definitely, I, I should, I was sort of trying to figure out how I could get this into the discussion without giving too much away, um, you know, the dreaded spoiler, but it does become the case that Jacob Finch Bonner uh, becomes a detective. Uh, and so um, if you, you don't realize that's happening at first, but, but that is what's happening. And because he's a detective, he discovers a lot of amazing things. Uh, and uh, so, and I, and I was trying to ask you before, how much of that did you know? Um, if I have to put a percentage on it, I would say about 50%. So the big twist, obviously, um, I knew that. But how I got there was in the dark, and you want it in the dark. You want to, you want to know where you're going, but you, you don't want to know how you're going to get there. Um, it's so hard to describe it to to people, I find that, you know, anybody who does any kind of creative work, they have a similar uh, predicament in, in that they, they set out knowing kind of, but not completely. And it's very hard for people to understand. Um, I, I run this book group thing called Book the Writer. And um, one of the reasons I love doing these book groups with authors is that in every session, uh, somebody asked some version of this question, you know, did you know when you started that this was going to happen? And they ask it whether it's a novel, which is kind of more understandable, or a memoir, when presumably you, it's your memoir, you know what <laughs> happened. Even in books that are biographies, did you know when you set out to write this biography of X that this, this? and the answer is always, I didn't know. I was shocked to discover this. And I used to love, you know, I would wait for the question, I would hear the question, and then I would watch their reaction to the, to the answer. And they were always so surprised. And I think, you know, when we read a book, you know, it's, it's black and white on the page. It looks like it's always been there. But in the writing of it, you know, it's, it's you know, you're hacking your way through the wilderness with a, with a rusty spoon. It's, we don't know. We don't know until we get there what it's going to be. So um, in this case, I knew one of the big reveals, but almost everything else I figured out on the way. Long yeah. answer. Sorry. Yeah. My, my answer would be very much the same. So I'm not at all surprised to hear that. So let's, let's uh, Nadine, what else do we have? Great. Um, this might be a little bit too um, academic, but Sean Hu would like to know what are the most essential elements in developing plots? What, what surprises you? I mean, what, when, you, when you open the New York Times every morning, as we all do, you know, which stories make your, your, your jaw hit the floor? I mean, it happens, it happens every day for me you know i'm shocked by human behavior i'm stunned by the the way people treat one another the coincidences in life i mean i think it has to surprise you and if it doesn't it's not going to surprise anybody else I, I would say that over the years i have come to um, recognize that um, plot and character 
are very much related mm -hmm. and that um, what makes a plot successful is if the character uh, can believably go through the various, you know, involutions and changes that the plot uh, is going to require. So uh, that what I'm trying to say in answer to the question is that it's much more organic than being able to say, oh, you, if it's a 350 page book, you got to have a great surprise on page 340. Um, because it won't, nobody will get to 340 unless uh, they have some involvement with the people that you're writing about. So you, in, in it's, I came of age um, in an era where um, plot was regarded as sort of an atrocious um, affectation of a bygone era. Uh, and, you know, the writers who dwelt in the, you know, the middle range of experience were supposedly the most serious and certainly the most venerated. And, you know, I thought that was nonsense. Yeah. I thought people, people want stories that will make them wonder um, what is going to happen, what will happen next. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's important. And the, the plot is certainly one of those books. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's critical as far as I'm concerned. Um, but that's not everything. I certainly went through a similar uh, progression from I do not sully my hands with plot. And when I first met you, I was working at Farrar Strauss. Uh, I was trying to write fiction. And the novels that I uh, was writing were very, you know, they were very prosy and very charactery, and they had no plot. <laughs> I mean, nothing happened. And um, it was only with my third novel that I, I made a, I made a, a decision I'm going to write something that somebody will publish and it had a plot and it and it did get published and then I then I had this whole kind of re uh, orientation to um, the kind of fiction that I want I, I had to I had sort of admitted to myself I like it I like plot and the, the novels I had loved the most were, were plot driven novels um, I, you know I have I have a lifelong uh, love of Frederick Forsyth's The Odessa File, for example, which mm -hmm. is hugely plot driven, and yet it has taught me more about human nature than you know a, a lot of the those prize winning books that you mentioned. Right. Um, everybody. Wants... <laughs> Sorry. Yes. A uh, question from another viewer. Uh, he wants to know he or she. Uh, in several of your books, you have written about academia and the intense politics that are baked into those institutions. Have you had experience in this milieu and what is it about this environment that interests you? Oh, I love this question. I do love an academic novel. I, I'll read anything if it's set at a college. Um, yes, I, I have been a faculty spouse for... 30 years at Princeton. I have loved watching uh, 30 years of students come through my life and my dining room in many cases. Um, I, I think what I really love about, uh, about college environments is that, you know, colleges, universities are places where people talk about ideas. Um, they're places where smart young people uh, are, are, are starting over. They're, they're leaving home, they're reinventing themselves, they're figuring out who they are. It's, I mean, I know it's a cliche, but it's just everybody's on one hand brand new when they get to college, but on the other hand, if, you, if your perspective on these four years of college is not, I'm a freshman, I'm a sophomore, I'm a junior, I'm a senior, goodbye. If it's my perspective, which is watching the students come and then come and then come and then come and never leave, um, you see that nothing ever really changes. <laughs> and um, it's this kind of juxtaposition of the newness and the sameness that I just find so interesting. And also that the students are 
constantly acting out and making demands because that's what they're supposed to do. And yet every single generation of students making demands of the, of the administration, they think nobody's ever done it before. They think they've made it up and they're idiots, but they're awesome at the same time. So yeah, there's a lot that I love about, I don't think I'm done writing about colleges. In fact, the, the new novel um, is largely set at Cornell. So there you go. Okay, you're back, back to a familiar haunt. Yeah, yeah. My husband drove me, we drove around Cornell and I said, wait, I gotta go in that building. I gotta go in that building. So it was a lot of fun. Beautiful place. It is. It is. So, Nadine, do we have time for one more question? I don't think we do, unfortunately. And I think this is a good stopping point for us. Um, thank you so much, Scott and Jean, for this wonderful conversation. Um, and everybody who joined us today to um, watch and, you know, wherever you are, thank you. Um, Go to uh, nationalartsclub.org for any upcoming programs. We'd love to see you. We'd love to see you in person in the fall at the National Arts Club in uh, uh, Gramercy Park in New York City. And Jean, congratulations again on being a New York Times bestselling author. That's amazing. I hope you're going out to celebrate right now. Um, and thank you so much again to both of you and to everyone. Please have a good night. Thank you, Nadine, and thank you, Scott. Yeah, and congratulations again, Jean, on a terrific book. So and enjoy your ride. I to read the one you're ready now about right. the character in the last one. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>